is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for the 2020 NFL season and talking about some of the unknowns this year with no preseason games and no fans by talking to a former NFL player. That is Orlando Skandrick, formerly of the Dallas Cowboys, a 12-year NFL veteran. We're going to get his perspective on what all this means from a betting perspective early in the season. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com, joined here by a masked up Ed Fang of the powerrank.com. Ed, uh, the podcast live, people can't see this, but on video they can see you're wearing a mask. There's no one around you, so I'm curious, what's going on here? I got inspired by the NBA guys. I thought I'd give it a try <laughs> to do, you know, a podcast with a mask on. I, you know, yeah. those guys probably don't have to wear a mask doing it, but thought I'd give it a try. And plus, I'm actually really excited. I got uh, some Dortmund gear. Dortmund yeah. is a team in Germany that uh, makes my soul very happy to watch them play, <laughs> win or lose, because they play such a beautiful style. Um, and I really like this mask. It's amazing how much more likely you are to wear a mask uh, if you like it. It's actually pretty comfortable. Of course, I just took oh. it off, too, because I'm not going to do this entire <laughs> podcast with a mask on. But, um, yeah, uh, so just excited about some new gear. Thanks for letting me do that. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you saw this, but like in May, I think, there was a NASCAR race that Denny Hamlin won, and NASCAR's had this policy where like, whenever you are outside your car, you're wearing a mask, no matter what. So he won the race, and he gets out, and his mask is a printout, I believe, of his face, smiling. <laughs> and so it's like, it's him wearing this mask of like this weird, creepy, ghoulish smile but it's fitting because he won the race. He said that he was also getting one printed in a frown fashion in case he wrecked and had to do, do an interview after that. So maybe that's the next mask for you, Ed? Is it just a picture of your smiling face? Yeah, maybe. Maybe there's a power rank mask in the future. Yeah. Uh, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of opportunities for uh, supporting your cause with these masks because yeah. it's you know it's obviously when you walk around with them people look at the mask because it's your face the denny hamlin one was honestly frightening so i i <laughs> i have no desire to get one of those but uh it's on the table just wear a mask it can be frightening i don't care just wear yeah. one uh we'll be all good as mentioned today we're talking to orlando scandrick you can find him on twitter at o scandrick we're going to talk to him about the impact of no preseason on the NFL. Both, uh, we're going to discuss whether the offense or the defense has an advantage, uh, which teams may benefit with the truncated time to get ramped up, and of course, talk about uh, his Dallas Cowboys. Most of his career was in Dallas. We're going to talk to Orlando about Dak Prescott and the expectations for Dallas this year. And Ed, I think it's helpful because, like, we don't have data on this. We kind of have some data on home field a little bit uh, based on other leagues, but, like, it's tough where we don't have data to rely on to know how much of an adjustment we have to make for these things. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, I, I think I, I, I'm pretty comfortable using what I found in European soccer. Cause I think that makes sure. a lot of sense. And, but, uh, but I think what really complicates things is in the NFL is that sometimes there's going to be fans yeah. if the team can get away with it. And sometimes there won't be. So that's going to be a little bit tricky. Absolutely. You're going to have to like, look at like attendance numbers. Uh, I, there was a, during an NHL game, they like flashed attendance zero on the board <laughs> for one of the, the hub games, which was hilarious. But we'll have to like keep track of that. It's going to be a headache. But uh, we're going to talk to Orlando about that in just a bit. But first, some interesting college football news today. Uh, the Big Ten announced their full schedule. Uh, got to see how that looked. And I know that their commissioner said that it's not like just because they put out a schedule does not mean it's a hundred percent. They're playing football this year, but it does seem like they're going to plow through this thing for better or worse. Right. And I've, I've kind of been pretty pessimistic about actually getting college football for a while now. I know you've been in the same yeah. boat, but it just seems like they're going to give it a try come hell or high water at this point. Yeah. I mean, I think it's been a roller coaster. So in, in, in April and May, I was pretty sure there was not going to be a season. And then in June, the COVID rates were low. Kids were coming back on campus. I'm like, oh, well, I need to prep. Yeah. And then the explosion of cases happened in late June, early July. And everything has been, you know, not clear about what's going to happen because of that. And I think if you're college football, like they're going to give it a try. 
Uh, I think the schedule is really smart. There's a lot of weeks in there uh, to reschedule games. So, you know, it's kind of like what I expect out of the school that my kids go to. Like, I want you to try. I want you to try to be in person because this is an important thing. Uh, you can have a lot of philosophical debates about whether education or college football is more important. <laughs> but clearly college football matters from the money end. The question is whether they're actually going to finish the season. Yeah. And what we've seen from Major League Baseball over the last two weeks is not really encouraging. We've seen right. two teams have a lot of positive cases. Uh, the Marlins have kind of scrapped together a roster of 30 they people. They won last night. <laughs> and Well, it's, it's nice to be playing the Orioles. Yeah, that doesn't it hurt. Is, <laughs> it is nice to be playing the Orioles. So... And, and baseball and football are different sports. And yeah. in football, you have a, uh, you know, the line play where you have the men who are most susceptible to getting hurt by COVID uh, engaging the most and face to face. So I think that's potentially a really dangerous situation. I think when, um, you know, hopefully this doesn't happen, but if a lineman on either side of the ball ends up in the hospital with, with complicated conditions because of COVID, I think that's going to change the perspective on what happens. And, and I think this applies to the NFL as well. Uh, the NFL is definitely going to get oh, yeah. started with some games. Um, and now the question is whether they can finish things given the state of what's going on. And I think college football is like there are so many added complications because like yeah. you're on a college campus. Yep. Um, it's hard to – especially when like these kids aren't paid, you don't have a lot of wiggle room to like police their activity. Cause like if you're paying them, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a different it's a discussion, but like, right. I mean, they're not paid. So how can you say you can't do X, Y, Z and stuff like that? So there are so many extra layers that complicate it from a college football perspective where I, I agree where they're definitely going to start things based on the way they're applying forward, but it's hard to know whether they will be able to finish. And yeah, you know, I feel like we're kind of, I've kind of been in the mindset with baseball where I'm just like, I'm going to enjoy it while I can. I'm going to sit here and enjoy it while it lasts. Yeah. And if it stops, it stops. But like, I got to get all these DFS laps in while I've still got it, basically. <laughs> exactly. I mean, Rob Manfred has said that they are going yeah. to charge ahead. Um, I was in this situation a couple of days ago where there were rumors that they might call off the season and people were calling for it. And obviously don't listen to rumors, but it's like, yeah. well, do I want to buy the data and start doing stuff with baseball? And I decided to, and I think they are going to, you know, yeah. they, they are going to move ahead. I think it's going to be really interesting come playoff time when the Marlins have played, I don't know, 40, 45 <laughs> games. I mean, who knows right. what they're going to end up at, right? Right. And, uh, you know, they, they go in and make that 16-team playoff. And so. Hey, maybe they'll be better positioned for the playoffs, though, because everybody's got antibodies. So there we go. You know, they're just <laughs> they're ready to rock at this point. Um, exactly. But I think the interesting thing, encouraging thing from a baseball perspective is the number of negative tests on the Philly side of things, despite playing the Marlins right. when they clearly had an outbreak going on. That's encouraging for baseball. I think kind of what you said, that probably would not happen from a football perspective. If you have two offensive linemen who would test positive, the odds that the defensive linemen or linebackers from their team are po going to test positive too, probably pretty high. So I, I think that there are a lot of complications here. Just hoping people take a smart approach to this and right. uh, and try to take as much precaution as they can, and I guess we'll see what happens. Yeah, and also like Joey Votto potentially had flu-like symptoms, right, or COVID-like symptoms, yeah. and it turned out that he was not positive. So, so that was also a good thing. So, you know. and it's good that he self-reported. Like there have been a lot of cases in baseball where people have self-reported, gone on the injured list, and gotten tested and found that they didn't have it. Like that's encouraging to me because it says. People are willing to talk. And that's also why it makes the, the Colorado State thing so frustrating. Where yeah. They're like, hey, if you have slim symptoms, don't say it. It's like, no, 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 no. Do you want your team to get shut down? <laughs> like, yeah. it's just, it's bad. So I'm, I'm encouraged by baseball the past week or so with no Phillies positives, with guys like Votto stepping up and saying, hey, I feel sick and reporting himself. So that feels better, but still, we're on some shaky grounds. We're going to get to Orlando Scandrick in just a bit, but first we have to go back to last week and talk some golf because I talk golf on here, and Ed, we got oh so close. Just couldn't <laughs> quite break through uh, with Brooks Kepka. Covering the past. All right, so last week here on Covering the Past, I was talking about golf for the WGC FedEx St. Jude Invitational, and I wanted Brooks Kepka at 31 to 1 to win it all. We got really close, but no cigar and betting or 
Close doesn't count in betting unless you decide to go uh, with an each way on Kepka. Kepka was the leader after round number one, and he dominated that round. He was awesome. Faded a bit on Friday and Saturday, but it was still very much in contention. But late in the final round, Kepka had gotten the lead back. He was at 12 under, Justin Thomas was 11 under, and then Thomas birdied 15 and 16 to get to 13 under. So Kepka one shot back as he bogeyed 16, birdied 17. So he enters the 18th and final hole, one shot behind Justin Thomas in that hole. And Kepka, because he can do this, because he's, he's a monster, tried to absolutely just bomb one to give himself a shot at the birdie to force a playoff with Justin Thomas. Didn't quite get there. The shot went in the water. He did rally for a double bogey, still finished second, but so close to binking that one at 31 to 1. Hopefully, you didn't go with the outright on Kepka. You had a top five ticket, or maybe you went with him to, to lead round one. But overall, feel pretty good about that one, even if it's not quite paying off. I think he lost like. 2.6 strokes putting, so if he'd just been neutral with the putter, would have been okay. Uh, but and I feel pretty good about it. It was it yeah. was nice to have like a, a positive sweat going uh, deep into Sunday for golf. Yeah, I mean, it certainly suggests that there was value in, in what you uh, were giving out last week, so I think that's fantastic. Uh, are you going to watch any golf this weekend with the PGA Championship going on, or are you sticking with uh, NBA and other stuff? I am going away with some friends that like golf, so I think I will probably end up seeing a little bit of that. Okay, there we go. So maybe we'll Although talk there's some... a lot of these guys like soccer too, so we might just have Champions League on. So you start Champions League in the morning and then watch I think they're in San Francisco this week. So you watch Champions League in the morning and then yeah. just transition to golf later. Yeah, there we go. All right. We'll get to uh, Orlando Scandrick here in just one second. But for years, Numberfire's premium subscription service has provided our users with expert analysis, survivor pool tools, and most importantly, the Fantasy Football Draft Kit, all for up to $49.99 a month. Now, as a way of saying thank you to our community for years of support, Numberfire is rolling out a new premium package for just $9.99 a month we'll, with all these sports betting and daily fantasy tools you need year-round. The best part is... That expert analysis, those survivor tools, and yes, even the draft kit are now free. My rankings, along with those of J.J. Zacharyson and Brandon Gadula, are now free. Head to numberfire.com, check out the new and improved site, and take advantage of the new premium package. Let's bring on Orlando Scandrick now. Find him on Twitter, at Oscandrick, a longtime NFL veteran. Played with the Eagles last year, but mostly played with the Dallas Cowboys. We're going to talk to Orlando about the impact of no preseason, the impact of no fans, and just try to get a player's perspective on what all this means from a betting perspective for the 2020 NFL season. Covering the present. Let's bring Orlando Skandrick into covering the spread to talk some NFL for this fall. Orlando, we appreciate you taking the time to come on today. How are you doing? Doing good. How are you guys doing? Healthy? Outstanding. Yeah, it's it's fun to get to talk to you because, Orlando, like, we work in, like, a a numbers-driven world, but, like, we're kind of going into, like, this weird territory where there aren't any numbers to, like, base our analysis off of when it comes to getting set for this NFL season. So I'm ready to hear your perspective on the, all of this. But first of all, how have things been going for you for the past couple of months with all the, the wildness that's been going on in our world? Just trying to stay busy, trying to stay productive. Um, it's tough. This is we're in, like, unforeseen waters. But it's tough. Um, as far as the season goes, it's going to be interesting. I think everyone's excited. You see, like... The amount of people that's watching basketball, the ratings, I'd rather up 14%. I think it'll be the same for football, if not more. Yeah, absolutely. Did you take up any uh, new hobbies during uh, the quarantine time to keep yourself busy or just kind of, you know, trying to make do with other stuff? Um, I've taken up some new hobbies. Connect Four, Jenga, Uno, things like that. Are you are you dominating in these different games? or Is there a specialty for you yet? No, not really, you know, because... Normally in Connect Four, everyone has their own little style. And, yeah. you know, when the game goes on, you kind of get away from your style. And then before you know it, you give up an easy four. Yeah. I mean, you got to get in your groove. All right. So that's that's the goal for, for you, Orlando, for this football season is to hone in your Connect Four style and your game and uh, evolve there for sure. But let's talk some NFL with you, Orlando, while we got you here. Because, again, like I said, we got a lot of unknowns heading into this year. And I think the one of the biggest ones – is the impact of no preseason. And I want to hear your perspective on this because you would know a lot better than us the impact of that. As a player, how do you see that impact in the on-field play, especially early on in the season? As a veteran player, no preseason, I think it's great. You get a lot of, <laughs> you get a lot of 
it, it's a it's a meaningless game. You normally only play a series in the first game, two series in the second. In the third game, you play about a quarter, maybe a half, and then in the fourth game, it's kind of meaningless. But the counter to that is for young players, some players, you're not going to get a chance to see them in game action. You know, those players that are like those gamer types. And so the coaches are going to have to do a great job of putting people in game-like situations. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, with the fewer uh, preseason games, um, I'm always interested in whether you think the offense or the defense has an advantage, right? Like, is, is no, I don't. I think it's pretty even. But, I mean, I think defenses, I guess, allegedly tend to move faster along. But this is an offensive-driven league, so... Right. You know, I don't I don't think no one has an advantage. Just what team prepares the best is what team has has the most kind of cohesion as a unit. And, you know, which team has a veteran quarterback? This is a quarterback driven league and teams go as their quarterbacks go. Orlando, right. one thing you, you mentioned, mentioned that, you know, we're not going to yeah. get see a lot of rookies. So that kind of puts Cincinnati, who I think is planning on starting a rookie out there at the quarterback position, really behind the eight ball. Right. I mean, Joe Burrows wasn't going to play much. And uh, Joe Burrows wasn't going to play much in the preseason anyways if he was going to be your starting quarterback. So they're going to have to do a great job at hmm. game-like situations and practice. And, you know, you're going to have to expect for him to take some rookie bumps and bruises. And, you know, his biggest thing that he's lacking right now is experience. Yeah. Do you, so you mentioned that it might be a downside for rookies to not have the preseason, not have all that experience. Do you think that veteran teams will be in a better position to go from the get-go at the beginning of the year? Like, are you thinking the more experienced teams may have the, the leg up early on? I don't. Um, I mean, because what would you say as a veteran team, like, for example? I, I mean, there aren't any because I feel like the, the NFL is so driven by rookie contracts now and driven by young teams. So you're probably right. Like, are there any even? I mean, of course, there's some teams that have been together and some teams that, you know, I'm normally playing together. But I don't I don't think that's a competitive advantage just because every season is a new season. You know, the biggest thing about the NFL is being healthy. Um, the teams that play the best together and the teams that make the least amount of mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. So if you were to look at certain types of teams that may do well out of the gate, are there any teams that you think are, are poised to come out the gates firing with no preseason games on the docket this year? I mean, I think the Chiefs, you know, they're just they're they've been together for this is going to be the third year going on. You know, they're returning out of 12 starters. I think you had a running back opt out. Um, they lost that a guard opt out, but it's going to be 10 out of 12 starters, maybe nine out of 12 starters. So I think that they, you know, they'll click. Um, I think there's other teams that, you know, the kind of question marks like the Dallas Cowboys it's going to be a new offense, new scheme, new coaches. And that's going to be a challenge for them. Yeah, absolutely. Orlando, I want to talk a little bit about the cornerback position. You mm -hmm. played it. You played it really well. Um, I think it's one of the most irreplaceable positions uh, on an NFL team. Um, why, why are there so few good cornerbacks out there? Why are they so hard to replace? It's a, it's a totally offensive-driven league. You know, the rules are centered around the offense. The rules are centered around the receiver. There's so many different illegal contact, defensive holding, defensive pass interference. There's just so many different things. You know, when you throw a ball, like three things can happen. You can catch it, you can, you can go incomplete, you can intercept it, you can get multiple penalties. Yeah. Right. And you kind of had this unique perspective on it because you played for 11 years, which means you well, kind of played in, in different, like, different well, eras. 12, 12 years. years. Sorry, yeah. not trying to shortchange you. Everyone so you wants to give me a – you want to give me 11 because you see the 2018 through – I mean, 2008 through 2019, but that's 11 years, but 12 seasons. Exactly. So 12 seasons, which means, Orlando, you played in, like, two different eras. Like, 2008 versus 2019, like, that was really different. Yeah. How tough was it for you as a cornerback to kind of always be evolving with the changes that the NFL would throw your way from a rules perspective? Um, cornerback, you just have to learn how they're calling the game. It's just a tough position. If you want to go back to 2008, it was a more of a two-tight end, two-back you know, three receiver set when it was when it was passing downs. But here in 2018, 19, you know, it's all three receiver sets, four receiver sets. It's a more passing driven league. But it's just one of those things where you can play 60 plays and have 58 great ones and two bad ones. And the only thing people yeah. remember yeah. is the two bad plays. Yeah. So, so Orlando, would you say, like, I mean, how much of playing cornerback is your physical athletic ability and how much is the mental game? You know, stuff that you just talked about, not letting bad plays, 
uh, get to you, and then also like uh, film study and, and knowing what the offense is going to throw at you? I mean, um, at the NFL level, the talent level, the, the difference between good and great is so minute. But it's one of those things that everyone has physical, athletic ability, but mentally you have to be there. Mentally you have to be honed in every play. Um, you have to go out every play and take it one play at a time. So I would say it's definitely a mental, definitely way more mental than it is physical. That's really interesting. I want to talk one more thing about the the changes we have heading into this year because it's not just that there's no preseason games. We also have most likely, I would assume, no fans. Uh, you know, I, I'm going in assuming that there will be no fans here, and that can change a lot of things. In Orlando, we've been trying to decide how much weight you want to put on home field advantage now with the fans not being there because fans clearly in a lot of places make a difference. So, how much an advantage do you see home teams having once we take the crowd out of the equation? I still think home teams have an advantage. You know, a road team still has to get on a plane. They still have to fly somewhere. They still have to stay in a hotel the night before. They still have to eat in a hotel the night before. So it's it's just it's just different. And mentally, it's different. But with the COVID things with both teams staying in hotels, with teams saying that they're going to bus from to and from hotels, I think it's going to kind of even the playing field. But it's you still get into the fact that when you get a team that you get Minnesota and they go to Green Bay and they're a dome team and they're playing outside, or you get the Cowboys and they go to Philadelphia in December and it's cold. It's you're still going to get those type of advantages and disadvantages. And I, I just think the crowd's not going to be a factor, but maybe like they're doing in NBA, they will use some simulated crowd noise and some, some things like that. And I think that one thing that's interested me at least is that it seems like there's been a change in the way that teams uh, address travel. You know, we've seen teams staying out on the East coast more often that they're traveling out there for consecutive games was there a change that you saw in the way that teams travel, trying to take, you know, uh, sports science into account and stuff like that? Was there a way, a change in the way people traveled? Not at all. I played in Dallas, so we were in the middle of anything. The longest flight that we had was to New York, which was three hours. And we went to the West Coast, which was maybe three and a half, four hours. So we never were one of those teams that stayed multiple days. I don't think that that's, I think that that's a disadvantage of anything. Um, I think you just stay the routine, you know, and you handle the situation as it comes. Excellent. So, Orlando, I, I grew up in Philly, uh, not liking the Cowboys so much, so I kind of wish you would have played uh, more with the Eagles and less with the Cowboys. But you obviously know these Cowboys really well. Uh, they're 17-1 to 1 to win the Super Bowl and minus 105 to win the NFC East. Uh, what are your expectations of Dak Prescott and this team this year? Um, I expect Dak to continue. I expect him to get better. Um, I expect the team to come out and play hard for Coach McCarthy. It's a new voice. They have a lot of talent around and. Obviously, I've never been a fan of futuristic picks. You know, they're really, really hard to pick. But, I mean, I do see them having a great chance to win the NFC East if they can stay healthy. Um, Philadelphia suffered a big blow in their Pro Bowl guard being out for the year. Obviously, their receivers are going to be younger. Um, Deshaun's going to be coming back off of injury. He's fully healthy. But it's when do you get back Alshon Jeffrey? It's um, can Carson Woods stay healthy again? It's also can Miles Sanders take the next step and you know, you just want to see if Philly's defense can pick up where they left off being dominant like they were at the end of last season. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that the the Eagles side of that is super interesting. But you also talked about the Cowboys earlier, Orlando, and saying that with the transition to the new coaching staff, you were you might be worried about getting that new offense in place. Does that concern you at all with the Cowboys, knowing that they are making a change after being with Jason Garrett for so long? I don't know. What concerns me is they're gone from being a power run play action team to who knows what Coach McCarthy's going to be. He's had a year. He's had a year off. He's got to evaluate himself. He's also had some a great amount of time to evaluate his team and to you know just to see what type of team they plan on being this season. Yeah, absolutely. So that should help for sure. And I think uh, I agree. Dak has proven himself at this point where we can have quite a bit of faith in him. Uh, you know, leading this Cowboys team. Let's take a look broader here. Any other teams that you think? Could outperform their expectations from a betting perspective this year based on the odds over at FanDuel Sportsbook? I'm going to look at the odds over at FanDuel Sportsbook, but I do <laughs> think that – I want to say I think that the Broncos are going to be better than what people think they are. Are um, you a Drew Locke believer? Are you buying into the, the additions they made on defense this year? What draws you towards uh, Denver? They're going to have a, a healthy Bradley Chubb, um, a healthy Von Miller, I think, another year in the scheme. Um, they're going to have, they've added a running back that's a dominant running back when healthy and Melvin Gordon and just to receive the, uh, the, the receivers they've added, the weapons, um, Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler to add with Cortland Sutton and, you know, just to have that running game. 
Yeah, interesting. Uh, Orlando, uh, before I ask you about Defensive Player of the Year, um, as a cornerback, who – who do who did you least want to cover out there in the NFL in your 12 years in your 12 seasons? Um, have some tough covers, but Calvin Johnson, he was just a full package. He was fit, he was fast, he was strong. Um, he was a full package. He's literally the best receiver that I've ever seen with my own physical eyes. Did you throw a little party when he announced he wasn't going to be uh, playing going forward? No, not at all. You respect the healthy competition, and you just respect him as a man and him as an athlete and him, what he has done to the NFL, what he brought to the NFL. Um, he's definitely one of a kind. Yeah. I, I can't imagine having to cover that, that combination of size and speed. Like that just sounds like yeah. an absolute nightmare all across the board. Uh, so let's talk about defense because obviously you know a lot about defense. You know a lot about the individual defenders uh, defensively. Aaron Donald is the favorite right now to win defensive player of the year. He is plus 750 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Anybody stand out to you as being a good bet to win that award? Any defenders you're eyeing as having a chance to make a, a big surge this year? Just looking forward to seeing a healthy Joey Bosa for the whole season. Um, also looking forward to seeing his brother, Nick Bosa. So, you know, we'll see. And then Miles Garrett again. But defensive player of the year so much depends on the best defensive player on a really good team, one of the better defensive teams. And I, I don't think that Aaron had – less of a productive season last year, but I just think that the numbers that the Patriots were putting up and what Stephon Gilmore was bringing to the table is why he won defensive player of the year. So when you were watching Stephon Gilmore last year, like what made him so good that he was able to win that award? What was he doing that was so special that to get that level? His team was phenomenal, but he was winning his individual battle game in and game out, play in and play out, and he definitely deserved it. He's a special talent. He's a tall, long cornerback. He's got great technique. He studies. I mean, he truly wants to work and get better every day. Who are some of the players you studied when you were coming up? Like, who was the the model for you when you were trying to hone your own craft when you were younger? Um, There's really not a model. You know, your best competition is in the mirror. You can't get caught up in trying to be someone else. You know, everyone has different attributes. You need to find out things that you do well and perfect them and just be the best you can be every day. Sounds like a winning formula. <laughs> um, so I want to ask you one more thing about Stefan Gilmore, because, you know, like in his first season in New England, he he kind of struggled. Uh, he wasn't the lockdown corner that they had kind of signed him to be. Did you notice like a change between those two years or or um... I don't think Gilly really struggled at all. I think, um, you know, sometimes things go your way and sometimes things don't. But I, if I remember right. his first season, they went to the Super Bowl. Not yeah, bad. I don't think. Yeah, don't, yeah, yeah. It's not bad, but I, I mean, he wasn't. At all, but to expect, to expect him to do what he's done every single year, his expectations were high, and I think sometimes we put expectations on people based on the amount of money that they make. Yeah, right. And that's tough. Yeah, sure. It's tough to live up to those things, especially when you're going to such a high-profile team like that. The expectations are gonna be huge. I just think it's it's, it's very easy for people, you know, being in the media now to say this person is overpaid. But we have a hard time saying this person is underpaid. And he's definitely not paid the amount of the best defensive player in the league right now. So maybe we can get you uh, hooked up to be his agent. Like that could be the next gig. That could be your new hobby for for quarantine. No, not at all. Me and Steph are good friends. We speak often. You know, I admire his play. And I've let him know that. And um, I just come from a player's perspective. It's so easy for people to say this person is not living up to the expectations of their contract. But we have a hard time saying this person is underpaid. Well, at yeah. least put yeah. put your words in in the reel for his next contract negotiation. We'll make sure they hear it. I don't I don't think at all. But I was just kind of combating and kind of playing devil's advocate to sure. the first season. He didn't live up to the expectation. Sure, absolutely, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Especially yeah, like you said, like sometimes expectations just get too high. Now he's defensive player of the year. What more can you ask for? Uh, any other players you're keying in on for this year, Orlando? Is who you think could have big seasons in 2020? Um, not really. I'm trying to sit back and, you know, be a fan. Obviously, I want to see how Ezekiel Elliott does. I always watch Zeke. He's been dominant. I don't think he gets the amount of credit. I don't think he gets the the rating when it comes to where he is at in running backs in the league and what he's been able to do year in and year out. Is it weird for you to not be in training camp right now? Like, do you have an itch at all or no? No. <laughs> Done with it? Over it? I've played football for over 25 years of my life. It's okay. 
Enjoy your rest then, Orlando. Enjoy the time off. Let your body heal a little bit and just sit back and relax. That is Orlando Scandrick. Orlando, we appreciate you coming on today. Uh, Thank you for answering a lot of questions that we had about uh, just how the season will work. And enjoy being a fan this year. Thank you. Covering the future. All right, big thank you once again to Orlando Scandra for swinging by and talking about the NFL for 2020. And Ed, I like the questions you had about playing cornerback and all the factors that go into it. And it was good to hear his perspective on it because he's a guy who kind of, you know, he came in as a, as a young dude, but also played for a really long time. You need a lot of different diverse skill sets to, to last that long in the NFL. Yeah, and I, I wasn't just trying to pump up our guests by saying I'm obsessed with cornerbacks. I, I am <laughs> actually obsessed with cornerbacks. I think they are some of the most important guys on your football team. And it was really interesting to hear him say how much he thought the mental side mattered. And, you know, I, I guess there's a lot of good athletes out there that can that have the ability, that, that have the quickness and speed, but it sounds like the mental game is, is a big part of it. And, you know... Richard Sherman used to write for a sports illustrator somewhere else, and he used to talk about how he prepared and how there were so many guys that were more athletic than him, but he got his edge from film study, which is certainly part of that mental side of the game. Um, So, yeah, I find all that stuff fascinating. Um, You know, I mean, it was great that we had a cornerback on. It'd be interesting to ask other positions as well. Um, I know a lot of linemen that think the mental side of the game is, is very, very important. If you could so, have been yeah. an NFL player, would you have been a cornerback? Like, if you could choose? Me? Yeah. I think I would have been the quarterback with no arm strength. Okay. Because <laughs> I can squeeze, like, I, I can squeeze a short pass into t- tiny holes. I was going to say you could be right. Jake Fromm, but then I realized, we, you know, Jake Fromm's kind of, he's had a, he's done some dumb stuff the past couple of months. So I'm not going to compare you there. We'll say late career Drew Brees. How about that? Yeah, or like, you know, like your Chad Pennington's that oh was my described goodness. as having a, a water pistol. Are you saying uh, Chad Pennington uh, is, is your flavor as I hold up my Chad Pennington figurine, which go. sits on my desk here, there just waiting go. for his opportunity? I think I've had Chad Pennington like 15 different video calls ever since I put him here. I pick him up nice. whenever I can. Usually it's not <laughs> because someone else brings him up, though. Usually it's me who does that. <laughs> no, I, I just remember Chris, Chris Carter. He was a commentator. Yeah. He's like, why don't you like Chad Pennington? And he said, the guy has a water pistol. <laughs> and I was like, I think arm strength. I still, th- I mean, you know, all things being equal, like, do you want arm strength? Of course you want arm strength. Sure. But accuracy is such a big deal, especially like the higher up in the levels of football that, that you get into. So, As someone who is forced to watch 16 Josh Allen games per year, I agree. <laughs> Absolutely agree. Uh, I think... I, I think it was great to hear a cornerback's perspective. I would love to hear what a center had to say because, like, there's so much of uh, the mental game involved there, too, and it, right. it requires so much uh, communication and stuff like that. I'd want to hear what they'd have to say about the impact of no preseason games because it's obviously important for Orlando, too, because, like, you have to be synced up with the safeties. You have to know what the linebackers are doing, um, right. and there's so much involved there. But on the offensive side, I think center would probably be the one that would interest me most there. So I uh, appreciate Orlando swinging by providing that perspective. Uh, Eddie did have a couple of uh, strip sacks for your Eagles back in 2019. So uh, he yeah. did contribute to the Eagles, even if it was mostly against them for the other season. Exactly. He just has to flip his time between Dallas and Philadelphia. That's right. <laughs> would have been fine. Absolutely. Let's move now into covering the future for this week. Ed, we are about two weeks into the MLB season. If I am yep calculating this correct yeah almost two weeks in uh for some teams or five games for the marlins and that means we can start to at least look at some data that's been popping up in that time what are your numbers saying based on the early data across baseball yeah so i what they're saying is some teams are lucky and some aren't and i'm gonna pick on one of your teams jim so Uh can't wait to get to that Uh oh. but but it begs the question like how do you find value in major league baseball and um you know my predictions aren't you know, my, my Major League Baseball predictions that are on the public part of my site aren't as good as my football ones, but but they can find value. And it's based on the idea of cluster luck. So the idea is that, you know, if you, if you have nine singles in a game, you're going to score a lot more runs if you put them all in one inning as opposed to scattering them over one each in nine innings. And in, in order to, to calculate this cluster luck, I take something called the base runs formula that was developed. And essentially this formula 
uses underlying numbers like homers, singles, doubles, walks, etc., in order to break, predict an expected number of runs a team should have scored. And then your luck is simply how many teams a, run a, a team has scored compared to that expectation based on base runs. And so that excess is cluster luck. If, if, if on offense you have a lot more runs than what base runs expect, you've been getting lucky. And then you can also do that for your defense as well. And the idea here is that you know, your cluster luck regresses to a mean of zero. Uh, pretty quickly. Um, there isn't a lot of skill involved in clustering of hits. And it goes back to the whole notion of clutch hitting or clutch pitching. You know, there isn't a lot of evidence that that exists in baseball. So uh, the team, uh, you know, the Minnesota Twins ah. are off to a hot start. <laughs> plus Uh-oh. 27 in run differential. Uh-oh. <laughs> but the cluster luck says about 17.6 of those runs are... Wow. Uh, so... You know, they're probably closer to a 500 team. Um, obviously, if you would have bet against them yesterday with Pittsburgh, you would not have done so well because Minnesota definitely won that game. But it's an example. And, you know, if you so my numbers account for cluster luck in the sense that they use this base runs formula to figure out how good a team is. There's a little bit of like actual runs in there as well. But it's really it's interesting. Like at this point of the season, when you have such small sample size, um, there are with just pure runs there are teams that are like three runs i think the dodgers were three runs better than major league baseball average and the worst team was you know three runs worse with uh the expected runs based on this base runs formula it's much more what you would expect like a run and a half as the top team and most of the teams within a run of of average so my numbers account for it and you know all my cluster numbers are on the public part of my site so the idea is like look at that table see if a t- see if a team like the Twins is being overvalued in the market. And it hasn't really been that much lately, but it's something to keep uh, looking for as you go ahead. Um, and then, you know, if they are being overvalued, that m- might be a spot to go against them. On the other side, you know, the Mets are, the Mets fans might want to still have some hope. They're minus 17 in run differential, but about 12 of those are poor cluster luck or bad cluster luck. And this is calculated for both offense and defense. Um, Seattle was down there as well, so there might be some value in, in betting on Seattle, although that's a tough proposition given how poor we expected them to be at the beginning of the season. Um, so, and you know, and then teams like the Dodgers are off to a great start, and their cluster luck is near zero. So that suggests that they're they're a pretty good baseball team. I mean, I would try to push back against the Twins, but when your rotation involves Randy Dobnak, who has his Uber rating in his Twitter profile, um, it includes. Lewis Thorpe. Um, it, it includes like all these dudes who like, if you're not a twins fan, you probably, or a Yankees fan, I guess for, for Andy Dobnak, they, right. he, he just bashed like Yankees fans on Twitter. Cause they were talking about his Uber rating. It was weird. Anyway, if, you, if you're not a <laughs> twins or a Yankees fan, you probably have not heard a 60% of the twins rotation right now. So like the fact that they're eight and two, I realize that's luck and I am not going to push back on that. They definitely have gotten fortunate with a lot of well, different things, but I mean, when you look at the numbers, like five of those 17 runs were on the, the defensive side of the ball. Yeah. And 12 were on offense. Okay. So so it's like the offense is, is contributing more to the cluster luck at this point. Sure. So, sure. And obviously they have a lot of talented guys uh, that take the plate for them. Yeah. Uh, Byron Buxton's back, though, Ed, so uh, nothing matters. Uh, everything's good. <laughs> like, they could lose the rest of the season. They could finish 8 and 52. But if Buxton plays most of those games, I'm good. I'll be, still be happy, and I bet the White Sox to win the division, so I'd be even happier. My wallet would be happier, too, so uh, no complaints oh. <laughs> from that perspective. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about baseball as the season goes along, too. And it's, uh, it's good to get that check-in because even early season data can be impactful, and it can tell us, give us signals uh, for where yep. regression may hit going forward. I want to go back to golf for this week for my covering the future. Uh, the PGA Championship is starting tomorrow, the first major of the year. And there are a lot of big names in this field. Obviously, because it's a major, you've got everyone here. But I want to focus on a young gun, and that's Victor Hovland. Hovland is 45-1 to 1 to win, and I think that's probably a hair too long because one of the keys for this week will be getting a golfer who can combine distance and accuracy. And TPC Harding Park is long for a par 70, so you do need distance from that perspective, but it also reportedly has punishing roughs. So if you miss the fairway, you will be in a bad spot. 
So I'm trying to find golfers who have both distance and accuracy, and Hovland is one of those guys. Ranks 55th in the field in distance over the past 50 rounds, according to Fantasy National. He is also 36th in fairways gain, which is their uh, field-adjusted accuracy metric. When you add it all up, Hovland ranks 4th in this field in strokes gained off the tee and 5th in approach over that 50-round sample. So the ball striking will be elite, and that's always the most important thing when it comes to golf. The big shortcoming for Hovland in general is his putting. And that matters in a major because you can't really have major holes in your game if you want to win against this type of field. But in a small sample, Hovland has not been as bad of a putter on bentgrass, which is uh, this week's surface. It is a bentgrass putting surface. In fact, Hovland's numbers are minorly positive on the surface in a 33-round sample. Now, I'm not sure that will stick. But if you give me 33 rounds of minorly positive sample versus 33 rounds of really, really bad sample, I'm going to take the 33 rounds of minorly positive and say that that is at least better than him being bad, even if it's not predictive of what he'll do going forward. And we've also seen Hovland make pushes in majors before. He was uh, he did make the cut at the Masters last year when he was just coming out of college. Actually, I think he was still in college at the time. Finished 32nd there. He uh, made major noise at the U.S. Open. Finished 12th there. So at 45 to 1, I think he's a pretty good value bet. If you want a little bit more leeway in case the putting does not pan out for a full four rounds, I think that Hovland is interesting to lead round one. He is 50 to 1 there. He is also plus 430 to finish within the top 10, which again, gives you more wiggle room if the putting does not pan out. So you've got options. I checked them all out over at FanDuel Sportsbook, but this is a good tournament to go in on Victor Hovland at 45 to 1 to win this weekend. So Ed, maybe you can uh, get up a bet with uh, one, with your with your friends who like golf and see if you can uh, yep. get them into a Victor Hovland bet this weekend. Yeah, or maybe I'll take him Hovland straight up against someone else. Yeah, I mean, you or can... His group betting on FanDuel is tough. I think he's in Tommy Fleetwood's group, and I like Fleetwood too. But uh, if you can uh, manufacture your own bet of Victor Hovland versus someone, I'd be interested in that. Well, and those bets are the best, right? Yeah. Where you can get someone who's, like, really fired up about so-and-so player and -and so-and-so team, and they'll give you, like, five points (laughs) off what the market is going to give you. You know, like my friend that wanted to set the Pittsburgh Pirates win total at 10 wins this year. (laughs) Or maybe 15. Yeah. yeah. Those are the best bets, man. They're just the Absolutely. best. Absolutely. Um, I unfortunately do not, do not have enough people in my life who are willing to do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 co- uh, I don't know. Consort? Is that the right word? I hang out with a lot of people who don't like sports. So, like, I can't, I can't get these advantages in my life. And I'm stuck, like, you know, I, just, I don't get, I don't get that, those advantages. And it's, uh, I feel like I'm missing out. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, these these for those of you listening out there, this is definitely the way the easiest way to win sports bets. Bet against find, your friends. Find a friend that is willing to give you some number that's like way off the market. Maybe I can I have a friend who's a big Yankees fan. Maybe I can get him to to bet me Aaron Judge versus the field for MVP. He might take that one. So uh, I'll ooh, check ooh. back next week because or even even like Yankees World Series versus the field. Okay, yeah, that would work too. I think either of those, but Judge versus the field, like, come on, like, yeah, I think he might actually do that one, so I'll check in, and I'll get back to you, Ed, to see if we can make that work. <laughs> that is all that we have for today. Back again next week, though, here on Covering the Spread, so make sure you are subscribed wherever you get your podcast to Covering the Spread. We're going to talk potentially college football. If college football gets going, um, you know, we'll certainly get into that as we get closer to the season. We'll talk more NFL updates on basketball and baseball as well. So it's a great time to be a sports fan. Make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. Ed, what you got going on over at the Power Rank for this week? Yeah, I had Kelly Stewart on the football analytics show you guys all know we had kelly on the yep. covering the spread last year she's a sports betting personality uh great conversation uh so you can get that at the football analytics show uh still i would highly recommend checking out uh the episode before that as well predictability versus skill uh i did a little example with three-point shooting in the nba which is uh not very predictable but is clearly a skill and uh, there's um, there there's an analogy in the NFL, and it has to do with quarterbacks, Jim. So that'll be coming out over the is next month. Is that a month. teaser, Ed? Is that what they That's call a, a teaser? teaser? 
that that's a teaser and it's actually it's actually really important and like, uh as a reminder, you have both the written and an audio version for the three-point there, shooting thing, too. Yeah, there's a written and an audio, so you can catch the the audio on the Football Analytics Show. And then you go to thepowerrank.com slash blog. Uh, it's been an interesting process because, like, yeah. I do, you know, I do a lot of audio episodes, and I try to do them like this, Jim. Like, I'm just telling yeah. you about the results that I'm doing. And then I take that audio and turn that into a rough draft and polish it up a little bit. And there's not a ton of polishing, but I would say that the written is slightly more polished. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, it's uh, it's. I think it's a pretty good read, and uh, you should definitely go check that out because there will be there will be applications in football, and they will matter this fall. So check the written version out at thepowerrank.com, uh, the audio version, and the Kelly Stewart interview at uh, the uh, the Football Analytics Show wherever you get your podcasts as well. I am on Twitter at Jim Sanes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big shout out to Calvin Theobald, our video producer who is stuck with no power right now because. There is apparently a tropical storm in New Jersey, but Cal editing up these clips after the fact. Uh, unfortunately, it's a lot of extra work for him. So shout out to you, Cal. I apologize you have to go through this, but we appreciate all of your hustle as always. Uh, make sure you enjoy the sports while we have them. Enjoy sitting back and watching because we're kind of in this perfect sports wonder world right now with everything going on at once uh make sure you follow orlando scandrick on twitter at o scandrick uh get all the thoughts over there big thank you to him as well and thank you to everyone for tuning in good luck with your bets enjoy the golf ba- uh, baseball basketball whatever it may be this weekend we'll talk to you again next week this has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel podcast network <laughs>